in the last class, we were discussing at the very end, this overall situation that had happened by the end of say the 19th century. So we talked about how the 19th century was this time of tumultuous change and social upheaval. We talked about people like Marx and Engels, and revolutionaries, Lucy Parsons out there being revolutionary, Frederick Douglass, a time of great change and social upheaval. But as our editors wrote, what seems to have survived that social upheaval and even become more entrenched is this idea of unilineal social evolutionism, which was expressed to us in Lewis Henry Morgan's work. I don't think he was the inventor of it necessarily, but he was particularly good at kind of coding it, at writing it down and making it more prominent. This idea that everybody came in stages and that they would progress from savagery to barbarism to civilization along a certain line and that those stages in the more how to say in the more racist version of those stages those stages were determined by people's race and so your life was determined by your your capabilities were determined either by your social physical environment or by your racial characteristics, and that determined where you were in the hierarchy of the world. And so what I was saying in the last class, and I think it applies in some ways to these selections as well, is all of the things that we read should be read in relationship to this overall social structure, which people like Franz Boas were starting to question or trying to question. And we saw with Franz Boas, he's known for what is called historical particularism. The idea that each society has to be explained, not on an evolutionary scale, but in terms of its own history and development. We talked about the archeology span in some ways, very boring chapter on archaeology, but that this was, this was an example of simply letting a society stand on its own. And that the method here was going to be going out and doing field work among other societies and asking questions instead of positing answers already. So Boaz was saying, look, the idea of social evolution should be phrased not as a overarching organizing principle, it should be phrased as a hypothesis or an idea to be tested out there. And so we talked about one of the kind of the principles of field work was, hey, let's just go check things out. Let's instead of sitting around here thinking about things uh, in the abstract, let's actually talk to people about them. And what anthropology eventually began to promote was the idea of culture and cultural relativism, which is what we'll really be talking about with this class in the Ruth Benedict selection. Now, at the time that the first anthropologists, people like Franz Boas, were doing this work, they were relatively unknown. They were not very, they were not mainstream. They were not very popular. There was not an anthropology department before Franz Boas. So it wasn't something that was very well known. And the idea of culture as a way of talking about human behavior was also not a commonly used word. So at the in some of their first writings, this is a pretty obscure thing that was going on. That, however, would change perhaps with most 
with the writings of Margaret Mead. And we talked about, we read a little bit about Margaret Mead or a piece by her about uh, the uh, racial testing and questioning the idea of intelligence testing as a way of talking about racial groups. But she is much more well known for the field work and the book that she wrote when she went to Samoa, which is this little island in the Pacific. By the way, these are going to be the Trobriand Islands where Malinowski is. And here's Samoa. And you can see some other places. There's Australia and New Zealand. We usually know more where those places are. So Mead travels to Samoa and in 1928 publishes Coming of Age in Samoa, which, is, which became a, a huge bestseller. It is probably maybe the best-selling anthropology book of all time, I think. And it makes Margaret Mead into a household name. Um, in, in these days, this would have been something that you read not just because you had to read it in school. You'd just be going out and getting it and reading it because you wanted to, you wanted to know this, especially if you were a young person. Hard to imagine today, but this would have been a, a common thing that people knew about. Now, let's take ourselves back a hundred years or so into 1928. Yeah, go back in your heads to 19, about a hundred years ago. And imagine Margaret Mead, an American from US America, traveling to this island of Samoa and studying traditional, what she was out is to study as traditional adolescent life in Samoa, and she writes her book, Coming of Age in Samoa, which coming of age is about becoming an adult, right? Going from being the teenage years, who is especially interested in this, uh, in this period of adolescence, being a teenager, and especially what it was like to be a young woman in Samoa, to be a woman teenager. What would you imagine that the contrast or the comparison between the American teenage woman experience, I guess we could say teenage girls, and the teens of Samoa would be. I mean, this I think I think it is still in this day and age a sort of common stereotype that people in traditional societies they have to get married at fourteen that they're much more strict on them that they have all these responsibilities and that we here we're wild and free we can do whatever we want. The thing was is what Mead argued and you know there was plenty of debate about this is that in comparison to the American teenager that the Samoan girls had relative sexual freedom. That at the time, this was a time during their lives where they were basically encouraged to or were, could go around doing what they wanted. And that the whole sort of rebellion that we have in our country, right, where teens are all like, oh, I'm fighting against the system, I'm fighting against my parents, that they didn't experience that that it wasn't a big deal in their lives to be an adolescent or a teenager, that it wasn't a particularly traumatic or fraught experience. And so you can see why this caused a little bit of a stir in the United States. Like people would read this, like, you know, basically, you know, it was like, whoa, I need to, I need to know what's going on. It was like something you'd hide from your parents. And it's like I said, she became this household name. I, you know, I don't know the actual sales numbers, but in terms of like the percentage of books sold, I would probably say this is still 
kind of the biggest best bestseller anthropology has ever had. And Margaret Mead for a long time was a household name. She got letters from people who would like ask her advice about things. She became a very popular figure on the lecture circuit uh, in her later years in the 60s, wrote for Red Book, which is, you know, was seen as a very popular thing. And, you know, the argument was that that there wasn't this biological stage of life in which everybody passed through exactly the same thing. That in fact, it was a product of your culture or your particular environment. And so, you know, this was pretty radical at the time. Ruth Benedict, and I want to talk about the Ruth Benedict selection here first. So Margaret Mead was, was a student of Boaz, but she was actually also a student of Ruth Benedict. She was taking classes with her. But Ruth Benedict's patterns of culture actually comes out in 1934. So a little bit, uh, Mead's book was already out there and already pretty famous. And if you focus in really closely here, you can see that it had a preface by Margaret Mead. So Margaret Mead wrote the first introductory pages for patterns of culture. Now, like I said, before this time, before Mead and Benedict, um, anthropology was not known. There was not sort of, people didn't really know about it. Culture was not a huge word. Patterns of culture, like coming of age in Samoa, would become a huge seller. Perhaps not as big of a bestseller, but a pretty big so a pretty big selling book. So this is a big point that she makes is that we're trying to look at other cultures sort of out there on their own terms. And I mean, this is the same thing that Boaz was saying in terms of historical particularism, that we, we're not, we shouldn't be trying to place people in boxes and rank them and, and talk about, you know, the, them in terms of the evolution. And what she's saying is, is it's very difficult for us to get out of the idea of our own civilization because of Western colonialism. Basically, the Western way of life has been spread all over the world. And so we think that that is a, an expression of universal values. Now, I just want to note here that if you remember our reading from Max Weber, Weber says that, you know, it's only in the West that certain universals arise. And basically what Benedict is saying is that is an illusion. It's not that the universals were there inherent in the West. It's because they were spread about by colonialism. So she says here on page 74, this worldwide cultural diffusion, that is the spread uh, via colonialism, has protected us as People have never been protected before from having to take seriously the civilizations of other peoples. It has given to our culture a massive universality that we have long ceased to account for historically. So what she's saying is, is that we, for, we spread this about through colonialism, and then we forgot that we did it, and so now we assume that our society is universal when it's not true. Her big point here, and the reason, you know, kind of wish they'd talked a little bit more about this in this selection is that there is no such thing as kind of this basic human nature. And it's also not the, our idea of Western civilization and excusing some of the gendered language from 1934, no man, no person ever looks at the world with pristine eyes. So there's nobody that just goes out and looks at it from human nature. They see it edited by a definite set of customs and institutions and ways of thinking. Going on in that quote a little bit, the life history of the individual is first and foremost an accommodation to the patterns and standards traditionally handed down in his community. So again, what she's saying is any individual person 
is first going to have to deal with all the customs, the patterns and standards that are handed down. From the moment of his birth, the customs into which he is born shape his experience and behavior. From the time he can talk, he is the little creature of his culture, and by the time he is grown and able to take part in its activities, its habits are his habits, its beliefs his beliefs, its impossibilities his impossibilities. So, you know, basically from the time you can talk, you are already a product of your culture. Its habits are your habits, its beliefs are your beliefs, its impossibilities are your impossibilities. In fact, the very fact that we can talk is we talk in a particular way in a particular language. So, Boaz, Benedict, and Mead, these three U.S. anthropologists kind of form this cohort, and Boaz starts training a number of people, but Benedict and Mead are definitely two of his most famous students. And what they're saying is, is that the what we need to do to understand why people are different from each other, why people think differently, why people act differently, why people have different kinds of ways of looking at the world and of living in the world is not is because of their culture, because of these patterns which are handed down from generation to generation, changing over time, but the weight of custom, the weight of tradition, the weight of pattern is extremely important. And that it's culture, which is much more important than either your biology, whatever your race or what we call genetic heritage or your natural environment. And in America, the United States at this time, this was a revolutionary idea. Because remember, this is the heyday of eugenics, biological determinism, so-called scientific racism. Uh, to say that culture is more important than race or more important than, than your biology or natural environment was a pretty radical assertion. And it was embraced by certain people. I've shown some of you this before. The idea that, you know, somehow it was the idea of Margaret Mead who enables people to explore different possibilities in their life. Now, don't take this seriously. This is kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a collection of essays. She's not actually, Esther Newton is actually not saying that Margaret Mead made her gay. And in fact, that's not, not true. But what she's saying is, is that Margaret Mead and others allowed for this cultural possibility that was not, or opened the door for people to think differently about what they could be in life. Or as Ruth Benedict probably said or wrote somewhere, or at least one of the intentions of her own writings was this idea that anthropology had, was more than simply the study of other societies, but it had a kind of social purpose. And that purpose was to make the world safe for human differences. At a time when the world was perhaps very unsafe for human differences, at a time when people were, you know, being psychologized, even, you know, in, in the eugenics that was approaching very quickly in the in the in Nazi Germany, uh, this was a, a radically different proposition to make the world safe for human differences. Uh, and this was part of the American context of anthropology. Now, in this reading, we also have some other early anthropologists who are not from the United States one of them from Poland, Bronislaw Malinowski, who perhaps has some different ideas about what's going on. Uh, 
Malinowski originally wanted to study, I believe, in Australia, but because of his national origins, he was not allowed to do what he originally wanted to do. So he found himself kind of plunked down in the Trobriand Islands instead of where he wanted to be. He would become associated with anthropological field work in the sense of, you know, really getting an in-depth in its own language, living with people, uh, associating with them more than had ever been done before. And he talked a lot about how his book is about the what they called the Kula Ring. So I think one of the big points here, I think, is that what he you have to remember what again what he's arguing against. And he's arguing against the idea that people in these so-called primitive places were simply exchanging things only because they had to. And it was only because of the necessities of life. And so it was only what you needed to exchange. And so what he's describing this is this large and complex ritual process in which people are trading armbands and shells and making a big deal out of trading around armbands and shells, which don't have any practical use. You know, it's like trading jewelry around. I mean, they're quite literally. And so the, it's, you know, you have these Trobriand islands and as he describes here in the one direction, wait a second, one of them's going clockwise, the other is going counterclockwise. This is on page 64. This circuit is represented by the lines joining a number of islands to the north and east of the east end of New Guinea. Along this route, articles of two kinds, and these two kinds only, are constantly traveling in opposite directions. In the direction of the hands of a clock moves constantly one of these kinds, long neck necklaces of red shell. So here, in this way, are the moving red shell necklaces. And in the other class, moving in the opposite direction, are bracelets of white shell. So in one direction, you're getting red shells, but you're trading for white shells and they're moving and they're people sailing to each other. As your videos describe, they're sailing and making these exchanges and it's all complicated. And the more these objects pass through the hands of famous people, they acquire more and more value. And so one of his huge points is that something that looks like this is nevertheless extremely valuable to people because it's been through the hands of other people and it has historical reference. Tori, what does he say about this, this valuable thing? What does he call it? I think he called it ugly. Like he doesn't understand. Like why would anyone want this? No sense. There's no value. There's, There's no, no value. value. It's ugly. It's yuck. Right? Who would even want it? And you know, I don't, I don't even think they were. These are bracelets and and necklaces. But people really wouldn't wear them. They'd like guard them, right? They'd keep them around, and they'd show them to him. And be like, hey, isn't this cool? Isn't this awesome? I'm gonna trade this to this other person pretty soon. But it's awesome that I have it now, isn't it? And be like, yeah, right. That's ugly looking. What does he compare them to, though? Uh, the crown jewels. So he goes to England, and you know he's not a he's not an English person. Remember, he's from Poland. He doesn't care so much about those crown jewels, and he takes a tour. Wait, have you ever have anybody you ever been on a tour where they show you the crown jewels? Yeah, you know, it's still a big deal. You go there, and they get really excited. And they, show you these crown jewels. And so he took this tour and he's like, they got really excited about these crown jewels. What did he say about the crown jewels? They're ugly, yeah. As I was looking at them and thinking how ugly, useless, ungainly, even tawdry they were. Ooh, maybe that's probably why they exiled him if they're calling the crown jewels tawdry. That's pretty yuck, right? That's like saying, you know, I had the feeling that something similar had been told to me of late. And so he's making this comparison, right? He's saying, yeah, these crown jewels to me were also ugly and yuck, but they were really important to the people that were there. 
I think today, for me, I think the best, one of the better examples of this is, uh, is uh, NFTs, you know, like, like paying $11 million to get a little, little crypto punk guy. I think a lot of these have lost value over time, but you know, uh, you know, uh, it was buying one of these. A famous, famous people were plunking down lots of money for these. Who's that famous singer? Justin Bieber, he bought one of these for a few million. But think if you bought that and then you could be like, well, Justin Bieber owned it. So it must be cool, right? Gives it value. I don't know if it still has value. Anyway, his point is in all societies, we give value to things, not necessarily because of their usefulness or their prettiness, but in the strange ways. Now, Tori, you also noticed that he is a lot of in addition to ugly, he uses some kind of ugly words throughout this writing, right? Kind of words you might not even want to say. He does talk a lot about primitives and savages and those kinds of things. He didn't always have the nicest way of describing things or people. But in his book, I mean, in his book that would become very famous and well-read, he calls them the Argonauts of the Western Pacific. The Argonauts of the Western Pacific. Who are the Argonauts, by the way? Huh? Yeah, but who are the most famous Argonauts? Well, it's a trick question because it's actually the origin of my first name. Never heard of Jason and the Argonauts? The Greek myth? Oh, very famous for you Greek scholars of Greek myth. Yeah. So what he's saying here, and especially, you know, 100 years ago, this might have been more salient in people's minds. It's like, hey, they have equal status to mythology. I mean, these are people who are doing these great things. So, you know, I mean, yeah, the language and the own opinion stuff, I agree with you, Tori. It can be a little weird at times, but sort of in the end, he's trying to, to do this other thing. Now, the other selection is from Marcel Moss, comes to us from France, and this selection is from a longer book called The Gift, The Form and Reason for Exchange in Archaic Societies. Like Malinowski, Malinowski, one of the big points I believe of The Gift is that there's no such thing as a kind of what people were looking for is this natural economy or the state of, of human nature, or what we might call savagery in which people were only exchanging utilitarian things and that in fact in many different societies as he puts it there is actually an obligation to give to receive and then to give back and so what we think of as this thing when we get a gift it's supposed to be something that we do from the heart right it's supposed to be voluntary and he's saying that actually there's something more going on to it and that many societies function on this idea of reciprocity, which is, you know, I'm giving you something now, but you're going to get something back later on. Now, he talks about this mainly, as you can tell, in archaic societies, but he also says that, you know, the, the French have their way of doing this in their systems of weddings and stuff like that. No, it's not just, I love you. Here's a thousand dollars. Go have fun. No, get straight A. It was, a bribe. it was a bribe. Yeah, no, we often use gifts to like get a little barb into people and make sure they're doing what, what we want them to. We also are in many societies being able to give away stuff. Generosity is a way to rise up in the ranks, to achieve status and prestige. 
Yeah. Right. Most discusses the potlatch a little bit here. And, uh, you know, there's that social gift exchange thing, but there could also be, in some cases, there were like these competitions in the olden days. And some of them, even people thought they got out of hand because there were these competitions to give away or to prove that you could give so much away or even destroy things. They were so big that you could destroy things. Anybody ever show you a film about someone who is able to organize this big event and give so much stuff away that they flatten the other person. The whole film was about organizing the big event. Huh? Yes, I am. It's me. No. Yes. No. Getting back to our main point, we have these people out there studying these customs, but there's this kind of undercurrent is that they're trying to make a larger argument about human beings in our own society. And that larger argument is that people are not determined by their biology, they're not determined by their social evolution, they're not determined by their natural thing, that people might express themselves differently, that the world was to be, that we should make room for human difference, make room for these different kinds of expression in the world. And so, again, the people like Boaz, Benedict, and Mead were often persecuted, hated, uh, investigated for anti-American activities. So, you know, they were pretty radical out there. But... <laughs> As we saw a little bit in the last class, they weren't necessarily willing to embrace people like Zora Neale Hurston, who were kind of out there being more radical, you might say, in investigating her own society and the play, place of uh, African Americans in American life. And this is perhaps in the sense that, that they, Although, especially somebody like Malinowski, I think, wanted for themselves to be the expert on what was going on in that society. In fact, Amy, what does Malinowski say about the Kula? Why does it seem so complicated? And do the people who are doing it, do they know what's going on? No. <laughs> we'll talk about it. Well, he's saying here, I mean, it's pretty striking words. He says, he says that they they can't see it from the from they can't see it from the inside. They're only doing their own thing inside of it. And he says that it's only the person on the outside. It's only the anthropologist or the ethnographer actually capitalizes the E there, an ethnographer who can see this culture as a whole. Ah, uh, let's see, what does he say about, he's, he says, you know, they have, they have no knowledge of the total outline of any of their social structure. They know their own motives, their individual actions, but they don't know this, this whole collective institution. It's beyond their mental range. So, you know, he's saying that it's the anthropologist, it's the ethnographer who has to put this all together to be the culture part of this. Yeah, Tori. I felt like reading that section, he was kind of calling them stupid. He's like, they don't even know what they're doing. They're just passing this thing along, going about their day. Right. Kind of like he was like, me over here, I know what's going on. I can see from the outside, but them, they have no idea. Right. Like, everyone is stupid. Right. I think in his defense, he wouldn't, he would say that we are also stupid that way, that we don't understand what we're doing. We're equally stupid. And it takes somebody from the outside, an outside observer to help us understand what we're doing in our own life, that we are also dumb. However, you're right in the sense that the anthropologist here is like the physicist. He, he actually uses the term, they're like the physicist. And so it's like, yeah, the people are like, they're kind of like these planets or something orbiting the sun. They don't know what, you know, the 
the planets don't know what they're doing, but it takes the physicist to describe the whole system. And so in this view, the people in a society don't know what they're doing. They're the insiders. I mean, again, in his defense, it's kind of like the idea that the fish doesn't see the water that they're swimming in, right? And so it's the anthropologist from this outsider, insider perspective who's able to say the whole culture. But I guess I think what I think that that perspective of Malinowski was quite different from, say, Zora Neale Hurston. I'm like, what's Zora Neale Hurston doing there? When she shows up, what is she saying about the people that she's writing about? <laughs> what was she doing there when she drives up? And like, you know, they're like, hey, what are you doing here? What is she there to get? Yeah. You kind of want like the, the story experiences on like a personal level, not like to see it from the outside, but to be in it. Yeah, I mean, she's actually much more valuing of the people's stories than them. She, she's saying, hey, wait, it's the people who are the experts. They're the ones who are the smart storytellers. That's what I want to have. I want to get their stories. Malinowski, I think to an extent, Boaz was also like Hurston in the sense that he believed that people in their own way had, but Malinowski is much more of a, he doesn't think that the people know what's going on in probably in any society, but especially perhaps in these societies, but you had to have this anthropologist who was the expert outsider. It wasn't necessarily so much that you wanted their, their knowledge, you wanted knowledge about them, but you didn't really want to listen to them very much. I thought it would be interesting to uh, to hear from about, there you go. I mean, here you have a person, again, trained with Boaz, as Smith says there, trained as an anthropologist, does a ton of field work, lots of great field work, and yet is also pretty famous in her time. It's a lot of awards and novelists, and it's not really accepted in the academy. I mean, she was palling around with Mead and Benedict too, but, uh, you know, in terms of like whether anthropology would embrace that perspective, not so much. And as Smith talks about, and we talked about, she ends up being dying penniless and in obscurity and it's not the anthropologists who rescue and and bring back her work it's actually uh, uh, black literary figures like Alice Walker and others who uh, noted how important her work was so we have this kind of uh, paradox of anthropology you might 